Hi everyone, I'm going to start with culturally relevant pedagogy. I think that it's really important to accept the fact that culture-free learning doesn't exist in our society right now. Everything has an influence and mostly our schools and our even our New York State standards have come from white businessmen more than regular people or educators. Um, so it's important to see that that influence on what is expected of our students and how it might not line up with their culture, their home culture, their background, and how it's our job to see their background and see their struggles and see where they may have been, um, where they might not have been aligned, and to try to help even the playing field a little bit for them. Um, building on our students' background knowledge and their history and the history of their culture, where they come from, their people. Building on that and understanding that, I think, can help us, help them um, fight oppression or fight um, things when the odds are stacked against them. And I think it's really important to understand that and to try to help bridge that gap as much as we can. And I also agree with beyond like just trying to bridge that gap, but to make an environment in our classroom where children feel comfortable to have an opinion and have a say in what's going on or even current event conflicts in the world, um, help them feel safe and help them feel part of a community. And human nature, we learn better in that kind of environment. Without sounding completely ridiculous, I think that the whole idea of critical pedagogy is something that was really surprising to me um, through all my years of schooling. This is the first time I've really heard of it. Um, and just knowing that there is like there is research and documented research out there that goes back kind of a long time that really views that educational prod, uh, process and, you know, like the text as considers the structural forces that influence and shape schools. And I think that's really important, and I feel like it probably should be taught in um, undergrad, too. But that's neither here nor there. Um, it was really surprising to me just to think about the fact that there are these structures that not work against our students, but shape our schools. And there's societal and political pulls and views that all influence what happens in the classroom. I'll abstract to this. I also read in, the sec in another article about the culture circles that it's mostly made for like dialogue and problem solving and that students do better working through those issues instead of just transmitting knowledge um, back and forth. So it's less of just them memorizing information or doing what they're told and then you know, working through it and figuring out the answers to problems or talking about tough questions. And I think that is a really healthy thing that should be happening in our classrooms more too. One question I have is exactly how do culture circles get set up and what are the parts of that? And then how does, how do schools feel about this, I guess? Like if I implemented something like this or pulled part of it for my classroom am i gonna hit any um administrator conflict or step on any toes because that would not be what i want but it's interesting to see on um, the one article i was reading Let's see if i can find it so i can just um, cite it but the one article i was reading said that a, um, that a teacher did this with her preschool class and then a group of teachers I would just like to know, like, how you go about implementing a culture circle. I don't feel like we got a lot of that in this article. In the reading, it says that learning is co-constructed co through social interaction. And I think that that is huge. Um, I believe teaching our kids to be problem solvers and to dig into learning and to be on a quest for knowledge and understanding is really important in a society that's forming them so much to be worker bees, uh, stand in line, be quiet, raise your hand, um, remember this, spit it back to me, do it right. So in a society that's forming them so much to be worker bees, 
I think giving them the opportunity to interact socially and to ask tough questions and to think critically and problem solve is it's so beneficial to them. Um, so in my own classroom, I would like to try to give my students more opportunities to maybe talk about some current events or even current events in their lives. Um, I do a circle um, where we get to share um, something about anything. I love them. It's news. So anything that's important to them, they're first graders. So I let them share that or how they're feeling. Um, and then we can talk about it a little bit. So I think I would like to, I already do that twice a week. So I'd like to do that a little bit more and maybe encourage more dialogue during that. Then everybody be quiet while the person speaks. And then I address it and we move on. So I would apply this to my classroom by, you know, just giving them more opportunity for dialogue and maybe discussing some current events that are age appropriate and, you know, having them problem solve through it. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, we're having a problem with students who use the bathroom too much during class. How can we come up with a solution to this? And we can all talk about it. Like just giving an opportunity for that problem solving, critical thinking and that dialogue, I think would be beneficial to my classroom. Um, so next I'm going to talk about the chapter from Kid Watching, Social, Sociocultural Knowledge and Experience. Um, the part that I really agree with and it really supports what I'm doing currently in my classroom um, with literacy is the section headed Organizing a Rich Environment for Learning. And in this section, it talks about how a lot of kid watchers pull away from having students um, fill out blanks on worksheets um, and learning about things that aren't relevant to their life or that they have no background history of and that they're not going to value um, and like copying random words off the board and stuff like that. Um, so I'm trying to pull away from that in my classroom. This is my first year teaching. I'm in a first grade classroom at a Catholic school that up until the past couple of years has done things very old school. Um, so worksheets, copy this off the board, write your spelling words five times each, um, plain Jane boring things that kids, they're not passionate about and they're not getting engaged in it. Um, it's all rote memorization, and that's not really what we are going for for our, for our children. Um, so right now, I'm trying to have my children become more motivated to learn and more engaged. So we've started doing things like instead of copying our spelling words, we're doing Play-Doh spelling words or beads, using beads to make our spelling words. And I they're way more engaged in that. Um, instead of doing our math worksheet we're supposed to do today, we used a dry erase marker and wrote on our desks, and it was like the best day ever. Everybody loved it. So I think that like what this section is talking about is that we're giving them authentic opportunities to learn, but also engaging opportunities so that they are motivated and that things connect to what they're doing and connect to their lives. And also then goes on to talk about more like relevance, ownership, and choice. And... Again, this is something I am really big into right now. Um, I'm trying to implement a little bit of daily five into my classroom. Which is going medium. Um, but giving them choice, they're engaged in it. They like to be able to choose what activity they're doing. They like that it's more relevant to their life in the writing center. They, they have words that correlate with their families. They have family words. Um, I have specific names for some of their families, so like if I know that my friend Jacob lives with his Aunt Tracy, instead of just having mom and dad as one of our family words, Aunt Tracy is up there too. Um, so everybody's feeling involved and they can make those connections. So their choices in writing that um, is not only about what they write, but how they write it. If they want to write a birthday card because that's more um, relevant to their life right now because it's their sister's birthday, then that's what they can do. So I really think that it's important to give the kids opportunity and the resources to make choices and to be engaged in the materials. So the more choices they have, the more engaged they'll be. And the more engaged they are, the less rote memorization we're doing, creating well-rounded critical thinkers, hopefully. What I find surprising, this is not the first textbook in the first class that has referenced um, sending home like a literacy survey to its parents. And to see like what literary behaviors are happening 
at home compared to at school. And through all my years of teaching, and I'm an aunt to um, a first grader, and in all his years of school so far, I've never seen these come home. I have never sent one home. I've never seen them come home. So I find it really surprising that that's such a pushed thing. And I see where it would be valuable um, because the more you know about their literary backgrounds, the better you equipped you are to and not only include the family and involve the family in their students' learning, but the more equipped you are to meet the students' needs. So surprising that I've never seen it, but I understand its value. So in page 25 of Kid Watching, it starts by um, one of the headlines that it's transcending the politics of literacy and schooling. Um, I guess my question for this chapter will be how do you stand up and challenge um, the institutionalized setting that our curriculum and instruction have? And how do you challenge that, especially like I'm a first year teacher. So how do I challenge that? Um, and join hands with families and teachers saying, I know I'm an expert and I'm capable of making my own teaching decisions. How do you do that in a way that doesn't affect your job directly, but where you can actually be heard and have a voice? So in my own classroom, I already starting to do a little bit of this, but I would like to practice a little bit more. Um, just really paying attention to the students' socio-cultural, um, their backgrounds, getting to know a little bit more about them and what they do at home. I'm definitely sending out some of these wonderful literacy surveys um, that I keep seeing. And I really enjoy the survey um, for teachers, a reflection. So I would like to, you know, focus a little bit more on getting to know their families and their literacy habits. Um, and also, I'm already starting to kind of slowly try to change things within my school um, by doing a little bit more data collection, um, but also by giving students more choice and more hands-on activities and moving away from the mundane, sit at your desk in your rows and be quiet and pay attention um, way of doing things. So I'm just going to keep pushing forward in those directions and hope for the best. Um, in Chapter 4 of Teaching Reading Through the Content Areas, um, they talk about ensuring acceptance, safety, and order um, in your classroom and building a respectful and positive rapport with your students. Um, this is something that supports my beliefs in literacy and in classroom management. I think that if you and your students do not have an understanding and a sense of community and family, you're going to end up doing a lot of uh, micromanaging, and um, one of our texts once said, uh, putting out a lot of the little fires instead of, you know, be having um, engaging and insightful, meaningful convers conversations and learning. I also believe, like, the literacy through the content areas, reading and writing through the content areas, it's a little bit different when you're um, a, you know, younger elementary teacher because our kids don't move, so... I am their teacher. They don't have a new science teacher or a different social studies teacher. Um, but I do my best to try to make the reading and writing and um, organization, um, webs and charts, I try to incorporate them as much as I can throughout all the content areas so that they're getting a taste of different subjects and different themes, but still seeing how important it is to organize our thoughts and to dig deeper into text. Um, anytime you give a writing assignment, I agree that it is true. You hear, are you grading this? How long does it have to be to spelling count? Um, and, you know, I never saw it as children being disconnected from it as a learning activity or as, like, a part of the learning and reading, learning and reading processes. Um, and I also found it surprising that it says, traditionally, we use it only as a product. Um, I feel like that's very true. You, know, you don't really realize that's what you're doing. Um, I love the idea of writing to learn activities. And I found that surprising. I've never heard of that. So the informal writing test helps students think through key concepts or ideas presented in class. So it talks about giving students more think time than writing time. 
so that you're not requiring them to do a lot of writing as long as their ideas are genuine and authentic. Um, and it shows their knowledge and it shows that they were really working with the material. So I found that surprising and very valuable. Um, I talked about the reading that is something that I've been kind of going back and forth with in my classroom. Is it says like for the writing to learn to um, display all student work of different qualities. And though I want all my students to feel valued, uh, I thought about hanging up their spelling test this week. We had two students who didn't do well in the spelling test. And I didn't want to hang up most of the spelling tests, not theirs, where I wasn't including them. But then I didn't want to, them to feel ashamed or embarrassed that, you know, they got, you know, a couple wrong and the rest of the class didn't. So I know it's not writing to learn. It's more of a product. But um, just like where's the line between what you should display and what you shouldn't? Because we want them to know that we're proud of the work they did do. And we want to encourage them to do a little bit better. But I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or really, like, I don't want to dampen their passion for learning. So I would like, going forward, I would like to support an even more culturally responsive classroom um, to where we are more open culturally and where I'm even hitting even more learning styles in my lessons and where I'm pulling families in more. I think that if I'm recognizing different cultures and celebrating them and celebrating different families and different um, you know, home makeups, then I'm going to help influence my children to do those things too, making them more, you know, well-rounded, good people, not just, you know, better learners or better classmates. So that's one thing that I would like to add to my classroom from this, this reading. Um, and also the writing to learn, try not to make writing more of the finished product and try to bring it so they are writing to express their thoughts, to work through their problems instead.